January 1st, 2024 earthquake that took place in Japan, in Noto Peninsula, that is located in Ishikawa Prefecture, uh, was one of the major earthquakes in recent times in, the, in Japan. Uh, Japan is made of 47 regions or prefectures, and Ishikawa is one of them. Uh, Wajima City in that region basically sustained most of the damage from this uh, 7.5 uh, moment magnitude earthquake. The area is a very beautiful area. It's a very scenery area. Um, it has a lots of cultural places. People go tourists and, and so on goes. And Wajima City, where the most of the damage took place, is a uh, for Japan relatively is a small town, basically. The earthquake uh, epicenter, fortunately, it was located uh, in the land, basically at the tip of the peninsula. Um, and the reason I'm saying that it was fortunate uh, that the epicenter or the center of the earthquake was located in land is because the type of the fault rupture that took place in this earthquake is one of those ruptures where one fault moves on top of each other's. Now, especially that type of fault rupture, if it's in the water, let's say a couple of miles in the, in the ocean and you are in the deep water, uh, then movement of the one fault with respect to another fault, what it does basically it causes the volume of the water comes up and that's what causes the tsunami. Uh, that is exactly what happened during the March of the 2011, uh, that it resulted in a major tsunami, uh, the, it resulted in a meltdown of the nuclear power plant, and that tsunami was mainly responsible during the March of the 2011 to uh, more than 20,000 people lost their lives because of the tsunami. Uh, so public were very concerned. So, and that's why you notice that the first thing that the Japanese authorities were on the TV saying that, well, there was no major tsunami and the, there's no meltdown of the nuclear power plant because still that memory uh, of the meltdown of the March of the 2011, that was 9.1, by the way, that was a 9.1 9 ma moment magnitude earthquake that took place. Uh, in 2011, so it was a major one, and it was in the in the basically the uh, the epicenter, which is uh, the point uh, above the hypocenter, where the where you have the basically the rupture take place below the ground. That's called the hypocenter. The point right above that is called the epicenter. In the case of the 2011, the uh, epicenter was in, in in the water. Fortunately, this time it was it was in the inland so it did cause some some tsunami uh, uh, but it wasn't uh, as bad it was about a 1.5 meter high wave that came mainly uh, in the vicinity of the wajima city and the damage was uh, uh, limited but nevertheless this is a strong earthquake it caused lots of uh, residential building to collapse and lots of people were stranded in the train station, in the airport, and so on. Um, the, the earthquake also the, uh, was fairly, fairly shallow. The, the hypocenter where the rupture took place was, um, was 16, uh, 16, 17 kilometer uh, deep, which is a shallow earthquake. And those shallow earthquake, of course, depending on the type of the soil and all that, it can cause lots of Lots of basically the lots of the lots of damage. Another thing that is important that I think that um, in general public when when we talk about the intensity or we trying to describe the the magnitude of the uh, earthquake, uh, some people refer to the Richter scale, but the Richter scale really is not. Uh, it's an old ways of trying to describe the earthquake. The moment magnitude is more uh, uh, descriptive. It tells you, gives you more information about the earthquake because moment magnitude 
the way it is calculated, it is related to the area where the rupture took place. It depends on the how much the movement took place. It depends on the rigidity of the rock and the, uh, that's in that vicinity. So um, all those factors comes into the play to to result into the moment magnitude, and it's more representative of the amount of the energy that is released during the earthquakes, whereas Richter scale is not. But fortunately, the way all these factors are played around, the, as far as the number goes itself, the, Richter, the number that you're in the Richter scale and the more magnitude, they're kind of close together. Nevertheless, 7.5 is a very strong earthquakes that took place in this region. It caused uh, uh, lots of damages to the residential, especially really, still uh, today's a Wednesday that I'm recording this uh, episode. Uh, the earthquake took place in Monday, so it's been just a couple of days. So I'm pretty sure that there's going to be more information. That's how it is. But nevertheless, at least we know that the epicenter was in the inland. The, there was no major tsunami, but there has been lots of aftershocks, and that's that's expected because when you have a large magnitude, like a 7.5 magnitude, you are bound to have aftershocks, and that that's going to happen. The some of the damages were related to the landslide. Uh, I saw some pictures that indicates liquefaction was a problem. Uh, landslide is if you have a, for example. Uh, a layer of top layer of a soil, let's say on a hill, top layer of a soil, um, slide with respect to the lower layers, and then the basically a chunk of soil slides, and that's a landslide. That can cause lots of damage. In this case, it caused the basically the roads, the the means of transportation uh, between the uh, Wajima city and some other areas were uh, shut down, and. The, uh, so th that that brings another factor that really when we, which is very important when we when we discuss the uh, being prepared for the earthquakes, you have to you have to look at the problem holistically. Uh, the concept of the resiliency, the community resilience, is very important. What do I mean by that? I think one of the episodes earthquake that we have elaborated on that. Let's say I have a, a hospital, right? I can do. I can put on a base isolation so that the content of the hospital doesn't get damaged, the building itself doesn't get damaged, and it's fully operational. But if I don't provide the power, the water, if the roads leading to the hospital is, is, is damaged because of the landslide and, and so on, then you cannot get the injured to the hospital. Um, so the the function that the hospital have to play during the earthquakes is not going to be there. So that's what I mean by the a community resiliency. In this case, basically the landslide caused the roads to close, and that cut the basically the access for the emergency probably vehicles and the people basically to, to communicate between the cities that were damaged. So, um, and there are things that you can do. You can stabilize. Uh, slopes. Uh, you can prevent liquefaction. Liquefaction means that, for example, let's say a building is sitting on a solid ground and right after the earthquake it just tips over because this, the soil that's underneath of that building becomes a liquid. So the building that is sitting on a solid ground all of a sudden is sitting on a uh, tank of water. So it just tips over. And, and I've seen some pictures of that. But both for landslide and also the liquefaction, there are some good solutions for them. Uh, one thing that really uh, caught, my, caught my eyes uh, is uh, uh, Japan is, Japan is, uh, I would say Japan is one of the most prepared countries when it comes to the earthquakes, okay? And uh, no number of the casualties in this case was uh, uh, the, uh, 
the numbers I have seen is anywhere between 14 to 55. Again, today is a Wednesday. Uh, just a couple of days ago, it happened. So I, the, the numbers, I would not be surprised, unfortunately, the number if the number goes up a little bit. Um, and going back to this, uh, being prepared for the earthquake, one of the things that in Japan they do is a, the, their warning system. The warning system in in Japan is is probably I would say that the best uh, probably the best in the world. Um, the way the warning system works is that before a major earthquake comes, there are small vibrations that comes in. Those small vibrations uh, last uh, five ten seconds, but and that travels really really fast. Okay. Uh, those are part of, there are two types of uh, motion that take place, body waves and the surface wave. Those body wave basically the, goes toward the earth and it doesn't cause that much damage. It's the, it's the surface wave that comes later during the major shock that causes the damage uh, and uh, the basically uh, travels toward the surface and causes the buildings and so on to get, get damaged. But these P waves, um, that comes before the main uh, shocks, basically, is uh, can be used in order to uh, shut down the, the gas line, the power line, prevent the fire. And, and the fire was a problem in this uh, in this earthquake, by the way. There was a there, there were fires. Uh, uh, I don't know how extensive it was, but nevertheless, there was a, there was a fire. Um, uh, this uh, P wave can also be used to um, uh, shut down, let's say, the high speed rails. And and each year, actually, uh, the high speed rails because of the earthquakes get get uh, 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 the, the shut down basically uh, based on this P wave. And I don't know exactly how many times a year, but I've heard the numbers like it twenty times a year. Basically, these high speed rails they come to a stop. But one thing that um, I was saying that caught my eyes was that uh, Japanese railway uh, agency, JR, I believe it's called, uh, they are, right now they are able to, in, but 2.5, three seconds, basically bring a high-speed rail that travels more than 300 kilometers per hour to a stop in a few seconds. And they're going to be, uh, they're claiming that they're going to be able to, to bring it to a stop in 1.5 seconds using a new system that they're going to be implementing. So, um, this new system, again, in my opinion, I think it doesn't really help the residential type buildings. Although there are companies now that they sell the unit that you can buy, uh, that you can install basically in your house if you want to, if you are in the earthquake prone, prone zone. But it's mainly really, it's mainly used to bring a high speed rail to, the, to a stop or uh, shut down the gas or the power lines and so on. Uh, so that's uh, regardless of that. I mean, still, uh, again, we are not able to predict. And that's one thing. We are not able to predict the exact time, exact day of earthquakes. We can tell in the regions that the earthquake can is going to happen. We can tell approximately every so many uh, fifty years or hundred years or four hundred years. There's going to be earthquakes because if you are in the region where the faults are moving with respect to each other, so you're going to have you're going to have earthquakes. These faults continuously move with respect to each other, and uh, so. Uh, but you can you can live you can live with the earthquakes. We can design um, buildings so that it doesn't get damaged. And in fact, in these earthquakes, uh, the the airports, the train station. Uh, uh, seems like the, uh, their major facility basically continued, uh, continued the operation. Uh, it seems that the major damages were inflicted to the mainly the residential residential buildings. So again, it's a it's a bit early. Really, I think we're going to learn more. But I don't believe uh, from what I saw. I don't know if I don't believe there's any new lessons that really that we're going to be learning from these earthquakes. Uh, other than it seems like this vertical component uh, of the earthquakes uh, is, is an important issue in Turkey. We saw that too. That that that, that is an issue. Uh, 
uh, that uh, that I, I don't believe you are doing as good a job uh, to um, address that as the uh, as other forces that are created in the earthquakes. But nevertheless, again, the fortunate thing in this earthquake, I think, was the fact that, that there was no major tsunamis, because uh, if it was a tsunami, I mean, tsunami can cause really damage, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, landslide and the liquefaction was again was was seen in this uh, uh, earthquake.